is South Africa ready to ditch coal and move to renewable energy? The coal industry is a huge industry. There's about 100,000 jobs in the value chain. The issue of clean coal is another debate that is raging out there. Coal is coal and coal is dirty. Economic evidence shows that renewable energy is the most job creating, the most affordable. Unfortunately for South Africa's grid, we cannot just have a full swing from fossil fuels all the way to renewables. Mines are creating dead sentences for those miners as well as for the communities. If you suffer what about the next generation? Welcome to The Big Debate. I'm Ridi Tlabi. As we burn coal, oil and gas, fossil fuels, that is, the carbon dioxide and other gases that are released into our atmosphere lead to climate chaos. From the rapid melting of glaciers on Mount Kilimanjaro to devastating floods in Mozambique, poorer countries are bearing the brunt of this devastation. Now, if carbon emissions continue unchecked, extreme weather will become the norm and cause untold harm to food and water supplies. In fact, that's already happening. People will die in larger and larger numbers from famine and drought. Despite suffering the most, poorer nations contribute the least to emissions. South Africa, though, is the worst culprit on the continent. We are coal addicts, and our emissions are some of the highest in the world. We have a abundant sunshine and wind to convert to renewable energy, but we've made very slow progress on renewables. Is that because we're worried about coal jobs or because our leaders are in bed with energy companies? What can we do to urgently slow down the rate of global warming and tackle the effects of climate change? What is the cost to our future? if we don't. Well, joining me for this conversation are Lungile Mashele, energy economist, formerly at the Development Bank of Southern Africa. Matthew Parks, parliamentary coordinator for COSATU. We have Patrick Bond, political economist at the University of Johannesburg. And of course, Michelle Maga, education coordinator for African Climate Alliance. And in our virtual audience, we have South Africans who are concerned about a just transition to clean, renewable energy. Welcome to you all, welcome. And welcome to you at home. Remember, you can join our conversation using the hashtag on your screen. Let's start with our audience. Wave at me if you think South Africa's leaders are committed to a just transition. Nobody. Okay, wave at me if you think they're not committed to a just transition. Okay, that's the majority. I really look forward to hearing some of your comments. Lungile, let's start with you. You were an energy advisor at a bank. We know that our banks here continue to invest in fossil fuels. In fact, we borrowed, that is South Africa, we borrowed heavily from the World Bank to build two huge power stations, Midupi and Kusile. Our banks are not creatively investing in rooftop solar for homes, as is happening in other parts of the world. And yet we have this gift, this gift of the sun in South Africa. Why the lack of vision, do you think? There have been a number of banks, um, some of which are, you know, NetBank as well as APSA, which ran with the residential solar rooftop projects, and they also ran with solar water heating projects. It will alleviate certain issues. However, the country does need capacity. And this is why there was a massive program to embark on the new build, Midupi, Husile, and Ngula, which is coal and both hydro as well. The problems there were ESCOM issues, it was contracting issues, which led to numerous delays. Subsequent to that, there was an integrated resource plan, which numerous banks in South Africa have participated towards in bringing us renewable energy. Okay, Matthew, let me bring you in here. You are COSATI, you represent Labour. We acknowledge and we know that the coal mining sector is a key employer here in South Africa, but it is the biggest contributor to climate change. You are an alliance partner. Does your partner, the ANC, lack vision? Or is it hindered by its relationship with labor? They want to protect jobs, but also they've got a cozy relationship with some of the energy companies that have been vying for lucrative contracts here in South Africa. Yeah, look, I mean, the ANC's got many challenges. I think we could spend the whole day discussing the ANC's challenges. Our concern is COSATU and the concern of NUM is about, we have an unemployment rate of 44%. But, but, but hold on, Matthew, I can't let you off the hook about ANC corruption. In the context of this discussion, 
we know that the ANC has from time to time gotten into business, Chancellor House, with companies, Hitachi, that are getting these lucrative contracts. Surely that has set us back. And if it continues, it will set us back for many more years to come. Look, I don't think just with the ANC investment arms might have an interest in this thing. Um, the coal industry is a huge industry. Many people have got a financial interest there. There's about 100,000 jobs in the value chain. So I don't think just one corrupt uh, individual could, could really shift things. But the fact for us, what is most critical is that 70% of our energy right now comes from the coal sector. It's a huge thing. The heart of the Mpumalanga uh, economy is about coal. So yes, there might be corrupt individuals in the ANC. We don't doubt that. But I think for us, what's the critical thing is the jobs, is the energy supply, and is those uh, communities in Mpumalanga and how we move that towards a just transition as quickly as possible. Do you assure us that you as Alliance partners will be vocal and get ANC people out of these deals. I've mentioned Hitachi, but we also know that the president of the ANC was chair of Optimum. We know that the Tegeta situation involving the Guptas, there were politicians. The ANC constantly has its hands on these contracts, and this is debilitating for the country. I don't think that we can diminish the impact of that. You need to get the ANC to speak for it. I can only speak uh, for it. You are an alliance partner. We want to hear from you whether you will hold them accountable as we sign new deals and move forward. So we've always done that, and unashamedly so. Because um, I is in a part of the alliance, but we've always been an independent part of the alliance. We were the first to say President Zuma must go. Even during the, the Ramaphosa administration, and even part of our ESCOM social compact has been specifically to audit all the coal contracts because there's a huge amount of corruption, not just about who has the contracts, but even the supply of the coal to the power stations, because at times people are so corrupt, they'll put stones in the coal truck. So we've said, look, let's audit all the contracts, the coal, the maintenance, the insourcing, the cleaning, the catering, because there's a nest of corruption at ESCOM. That is really what has put ESCOM in the deep, dark hole it is currently. If you want to save ESCOM, if you want to save the economy, we have to tackle the demons of corruption, no matter who's involved, whether they are friends or families. Well... We'll drink to that. We want to see that day. Michelle, let's bring you in here. This is about young people such as yourself, whose future is in peril if we continue with business as usual. What is your message today? For us to truly commit to a just transition, we need to properly understand that what youth across the world and particularly in South Africa are calling for is a system change. We need to get to a point where every single person is involved. Currently with the energy crisis, it's because people aren't being, one, listened to when we look at civil society organizations or calling on um, government to actually start working toward a just transition. There's always excuses and we continually hear, you know, we can't turn around the situation overnight and we understand that, but what has happened since we started calling on change. So it's really, really worrisome. And we need them to actually start putting in work for us to start moving toward a just transition. Patrick, let me bring you in here. Why have we made such slow progress in South Africa towards clean, affordable energy? Most of the people, and I include the Department of Minerals and Energy on this, um, they really have, instead of a genuine public interest, they have a minerals energy complex problem. That's what we academics call the sort of power block. It goes way back, you know, a century back. And the transition from apartheid to democracy actually opened up more uh, relationships, particularly with multinational corporates. So many of the problems in ESCOM, we just mentioned, say, Hitachi bribing the African National Congress. It's not just the ANC. And, you know, the most famous case in ESCOM might be Danny Odendal, who arranged that his brother would get the conveyor belt, and that kept breaking. And in fact, the SIU, the Special Investigating Unit, found 139 billion rand with Madupi and Kusile. I would add uh, Vali Musa, who was the ESCOM chair and in the ANC Finance Committee to do that Hitachi deal. And now Cyril Ramaphosa has just made him basically the head of the Presidential Climate uh, Commission. Unless we get really angry about these old guard guys. And, you know, Cyril Ramaphosa was, with Shenduka, a coal mining tycoon. And I think it's that block that answers your question. Why have we been so slow? A second answer very quickly is that we're the most unequal country in the world. So I think with the basic income grant, especially if we need to get climate relief and just transition support to communities as we move out of coal, and also communities that are going to be hit hard by the 
climate catastrophe, like the cyclones that are coming into Mpumalanga, Cyclone Eloots, this year killed a couple of dozen. Then we've got a vehicle, the basic income grant, that could start making that just transition quick and much less corrupt. Gareth from the department, let me bring you in here. Patrick says you're not committed as government to clean energy, to making it affordable because of these deals and often involving people who have shown themselves to be susceptible to influence that is not good for society. In answering that, keeping in mind that a major deal has just been announced by the UK at COP26, where the UK, the USA and other countries are going to help South Africa's transition from fossil fuels to cleaner energy. There's already concern that some of this money will be used to finance gas projects using gas from Mozambique, and there's already uh, corruption. Your comment? The starting point is that government intent is expressed in the various policy positions uh, that government take on the issue of climate change and climate resilience. The NDP already, when we approved it in 2012, had a specific chapter and specific injunctions that uh, then marshaled government around doing certain things that would move us towards a climate resilient and lower carbon economy. In our case, as the DMRE, uh, through our key policy instrument, the uh, integrated resource plan, provision is made for a gradual move from coal fire based uh, power generation to more cleaner forms of energy, including renewable sources. The IRP, for instance, sets a target for more than 20% reduction in coal fired use by the end of 2030. Now, it's important that part of this debate really should be if we then remove the base load. We need to also then have a discussion about what replaces that. And I think that's where the gas debate comes in. And it's quite a, a raging debate. The main sources of renewable energy that we use at the moment is wind and solar, which are intermittent sources. They are not able to provide base load and they need some kind of a backup support. And for now, the option that we have on the table is gas as that backup support to enable an organized transition towards renewable sources. So indeed, it's part of the mix that is being implemented, I think, globally. One of the key aspects that we need to focus on is energy security and market stability. We cannot have a wide swing from the one to the other. Patrick, do you accept that? I mean, the minister has said that as well, right? That we can't just do this radical change. Is gas an acceptable intermediate? If you can do a cost-benefit analysis, Gareth, and you put the, it's technically called the social cost of carbon, the damage from methane, this is what we're talking about. It's about 80 times worse on a bad day as an, an emission for warming the planet, although it, unfortunately, that's what um, Andre de Reuters, the CEO of ESCOM, is utterly committed to. There's no just transition when you have somebody who wants to go not from uh, coal to renewable, but from coal to methane. And that locks us in for decades. Once the Mozambique gas has been exhausted, which isn't far from now, then we go north, we go to Cabo Delgado. And it's shocking to me that we've already put 2 billion rand into our SANDF troops going to get gas, well, really to defend Total, ExxonMobil, Eni, the Italians, and China National Petroleum Corporation. Now, that's not the way we should be doing it. We should be paying them a climate debt and trying to encourage them not to extract that gas. And we should find a different route because when you talk about wild swings, Gareth, to go from our own coal to a bloody war zone where 3,000 people died to get the gas. I think that's a terribly wild mistake. All right, you're really scaring us here, Patrick. But Michelle, how do you feel hearing that we're not about to go wholly to re renewable energy? What we're not seeing from government at the moment is a commitment to upskill. We're not seeing a commitment to reskill. We're not seeing a commitment to guide the generation of tomorrow to be able to participate wholly in an economy that prioritizes um, climate change. So that is really, really worrisome to hear that from a government representative to say that, you know what, we can't commit to this. Lungile, help us out here. I mean, do you have empathy or sympathy for the government uh, position? What are your thoughts? So let me start off by saying that South Africa is not a single issue country. We've got numerous issues related to unemployment, particularly youth unemployment in this country. We've got issues related to gender-based violence, to crime, to a lack of growth, a lack of industrialization. These are all the factors that we need to take into account when designing energy policy. 
and the representative from DMRE is correct in saying that unfortunately for South Africa's grid, we cannot just have a full swing from fossil fuels all the way to renewables. When we have renewables only, because of their intermittency, they create what we call voltage instability. And so this is why there is a need for gas to then counter that instability. In the Integrated Resource Plan 2019, it has been given that where we see our grid in 20, 30 years time is primarily solar and wind and perhaps 30% of gas. Lungile, thank you very much. Seldom do we think of the communities who pay the ultimate price for our nation's dependence on coal. When we return, we talk to activists in Mpumalanga who are tired of breathing deadly air. Everyone has the right to an environment not harmful to their health or well-being. That's Section 24 of the Constitution. What about the right to breathe? For communities that live in Emalahleni, Mpumalanga's place of coal, inhaling clean, breathable air is a daily struggle. After countless empty promises to clean up the air, the community has had enough. On 17th May this year, Vugani Environmental Justice Movement in Action took the South African government to court in what has been dubbed the deadly air case. Take a look at this. If it does, it's on the list, it's to put a rosis on my gate in an an how about seen on a parrot, seen Janet in. Bumalanga produces over 80% of South Africa's coal. The townships of Wakuka and Pola are nestled between 15 coal-powered stations, making the area one of the most polluted in the world. Logo plunga kulu gulum parrot suit. Even in nature, is flatla busy green, nothing pillows it busy right. So ever since Kwaban is mine, Yonkinto it has changed from green to grey. Ageko, good those who are in authority, Zuguti, Mobatina Sipezu, let us make Mthambe Sibone Guti, Sibasis Aganja Niglom Parat. It's fashionable to attack coal. It has become fashionable, even if you have no alternative, because you can close all those power stations, sell them, close them, sit in darkness. Just cutting listening, I seven zelitin, like is. When the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy's policies promise a just transition to renewables. You don't go and close power station with the hope that you'll have something new. You systematically reduce coal generation, invest on clean coal technologies so that the resource that we're having, we use it. Government, I'm a police worker or a in charge, but but the implementation, the monitoring, INZG. They mine the Tembisile, Ugutazo Akamatlini, Kizake, Ikolo, Zake, Yonkintezi Akai. So, as it wins, it all. And while empty promises abound, climate activists pay the highest price. Gupshumu, Uguti, Ulela, Ikinis, Ukuluma, Ikinis, Ekin and Gogonga, Uvuktiwa, Ekom, Eden Sebenzanano, Lincoln, and Lenzi. This is so unfair. What about the next generation? Okay, Nandi from Pumalanga, you are in our audience. I'm so sorry for the losses that you've suffered as a community. What do you say to the minister? I'm so disappointed. Like, that's all I can say. Because ever since uh, we had mines in our community, there's so much division in the community and we don't see any progress. We don't even have a proper clinic. We have a small clinic that is not functioning very well. So 
people are dying each and every day. When you say people are dying, is it for, for health reasons? Yes, I mean health-wise. We have a case of a child who's two years old who has a, a respiratory problem. And when you go against the mine, you get killed. Okay, I think you're talking there, the activist who was killed, Figile Njangase, and it was quite a prominent case in that part of the world. But Matthew, so here are the coal mining companies extracting this resource from Bumalanga, yet the people cannot breathe. The companies that are benefited, benefiting from the resource and the labor are not investing in those communities. This seems like an unequal and toxic relationship. No, it is. And our entire economy is an unequal and toxic one. Um, but we have to do what we have right now. Right now, we've got an unemployment rate of 44%. Um, you've seen since the 1980s, the mining industry has gone from a million mine workers' jobs, the backbone of the economy, to about 450,000 today, and it's likely to, to decrease further. So we have to deal with many difficult things, and these are painful things, because the, you're right, the devastation of those communities is terrible. And even to Gauteng, to Lepalali, etc., it's quite bad. Focus should, should be about this transition, and it must be a just one. We have to gradually invest in new capacity. We also, as you would know, have huge load shedding. We have a, a third under capacity of our current generation mix. We need every single bit of generation we can grab right now. And renewable is a key one because it's fast, it's cheap, it's quick to establish, etc. Equally ready, we have to deal with the issue that a third of ESCOM's generation capacity, largely coal, is going off grid by 2030. And ESCOM is broke, it doesn't have two cents. So you have to find money and diverse new generation and to do it quickly. We also have to give a sense of hope to these workers and these mines who are poorly paid also experience horrendous uh, damage to the health, to the lungs. You know, mine workers don't live a long time. And to give a sense of hope to them that there is a life after these mines reach the end of the lifespan. So there's many difficult things you have to juggle at once already. Okay, let's bring in the department here. Isn't it government's responsibility to protect these communities? It seems as if they are left on their own while the companies with whom the government gets into these deals just extract what they need without investing in the community. How are we going to reverse these bad policy choices? The government must come up with policies that ensure that those who get the most invest the most. Shouldn't they pay some sort of climate debt to communities and households? Indeed, the, the, the challenges faced by communities, I think it is, uh, as Matthew said, it's not just um, restricted to Mpumalanga. We are faced as a country with very, very severe socioeconomic challenges, uh, issues of unemployment at a very high rate, uh, issues of uh, poverty, deprivation and inequality. And then on top of that, we have this uh, challenge of a climate crisis. Mine companies are sub supposed to have what we call social and labor plans. And I think one of the key areas that we definitely need to focus more on on our side is the monitoring and the processes of making sure that uh, the industry stick to commitments made to the, the communities, especially the immediate communities around them. And there's a lot that, that I think is currently underway in terms of trying to deal with with that uh, specifically. So there is a need for government to take a much more stronger role in terms of making sure that commitments that were made, that they are actually implemented uh, on the ground. I think that is also another theme that is coming out quite clearly in this discussion, that there's a cry out saying that uh, we need to be part of this solution as communities and not be seen as spectators to this particular process. And I think we, we take note of that. Okay, Patrick, you say keep the coal in the hole. You need to keep all fossil fuels underground if we don't want to see the end of our civilization as we know it. Certainly a, a huge chunk of this problem would be solved if we could get the Glasgow negotiators to actually tell big companies, leave them underground, leave these fossil fuels underground, save them for future generations who will use them responsibly. Um, if people like Michelle or Greta Thunberg, if they're furious at our generation, one good reason to be is that we're using the wealth, we're taking the natural wealth, we're ripping it out and we're processing it with carbon intensive electricity. That'll kick back at us when we start getting climate sanctions. That'll start in 2023 because people like Gareth and Mungile simply haven't given us the commitment to make the changes to renewables and to storage systems like pump water or the molten solar so we don't have that baseload crisis. And as a result, ready, we're going to have sanctions by some of our major trading partners on our exports because they are so carbon intensive. Let's hear from our audience. I can see so many people are just desperate to weigh in on this one. Cleopatra, what do you want to say about this? 
I'm very disappointed on what Kerry is saying. And Kerry, for your information, as communities who are directly affected, we are not stupid. And we've been coming to your department for decades now, and you are not responding. You are not even showing a human re remorse that you are sympathizing with communities. All you are concerned is profit, profit, profit. And come, I tell you, please pass this message to Mantashe that there is no clean or white coal. Coal is coal and coal is dirty. To prove you that coal is dirty and coal is not going to work for us, uh, Mama Nchanga says that you must know that is in your hands. Together with the bazooka and other activists, it's in your hands. And our they are tears, and our tears will one day respond to us. I'm very pissed off and angry. Okay, I, I, I can hear that. And we know Bazuga was from uh, Ekolobeni. And uh, Gareth, I, I do hear the message there in your hands, meaning the Department of Minerals and Energy, not you personally. But these are real cries. And I don't want us to leave here without accounting to the people. They don't believe that government is on their side. And I think she also makes a pertinent uh, point that when it comes to coal, there's no middle ground. What's your response? Thanks to, to Cleopatra, and I think I, I, I do understand the point, and I do I do get it. The issue of clean coal is another debate that is raging out there. Um, there's a lot of work that we are doing with regards to uh, what we call carbon capture, working with our international partners to look at uh, technologies that can um, uh, enhance our ability to capture and utilize carbon from existing uh, 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 carbon, carbon emissions uh, uh, facilities and installations. Technology by its very nature is something that needs to be invested in and developed. And I think it would be very wrong of us if we say that we will not even consider something that at the end of the day may make a difference to how we actually exploit the resources that we have currently. Lungile, let me bring you in here. No such thing as clean coal, but also answering the question around nuclear and gas, that they perhaps won't have the capacity to create jobs to the extent that we, we need jobs here in South Africa. Your comment? In terms of gas, yes, it will create jobs. And I want to emphasize this, and you know, again, that we're not a single issue country. And this is why gas is, has a, such a huge focus because of the regional impact that it will have, not just for South Africa, but for Mozambique as a country, as well as for all other countries around Mozambique. Looking at utilizing of Mozambique's gas. And this is why there's this, what we call a regional and ascetic gas master plan to grow the region ultimately. Looking at nuclear, nuclear would be the best option if we're talking about zero emissions. The problem with nuclear is the time it will take to construct. You know, of course, there is the perceived corruption around it, but in terms of if we were to look at nuclear, it would certainly work. However, that's a 10 to 15 year plan. And South Africa has an immediate crisis. And each single day that we load shed for every level of load shading that we have, that is 1 billion rand flushed down the economy. So yesterday we were load shedding at stage four. That's 4 billion rand lost to our economy just for that. So we need immediate solutions. And these solutions can certainly be found in renewables to a certain extent. And I'm glad that the um, community in Bumalanga is actually rising up because one of the biggest issues that, that ESCOM has been lax on has been the environmental caps that they've breached. And time and time again, they've been asking for extensions and extensions. So there needs to come a, a point where ESCOM takes this so seriously and the minister is then able to impose not only fines, but actually arrest the CEO of ESCOM for breaching these caps as well, because it is unacceptable. And this is where part of the transition has to come from. But but the problem is it must happen at a scale and a pace that South Africa can afford. Otherwise, we're going to end up in a lot of debt trying to fight problems that can be solved in numerous other ways. 
I think what you've just said also then explains why the community in Mpumalanga is justified in being angry. You talked about the government constantly extending, 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 literally being very generous to the very mining companies that are creating conditions that are so debilitating to those communities. Why be so lenient? It's that toxic proximity and relationship between political power, our policymakers, and the companies that benefit from the natural resources. Okay, we do have Alex from Africa 350. Your comment. It's interesting the way that job creation and load shedding is, is pushed around in this debate because the economic evidence shows that renewable energy is the most job creating, the most affordable, and also the fastest way to address load shedding. Right. And so we've got the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy, which is trying to force in new coal power plants, with lots of polluting fossil gas. I'm also serve as secretary of the Climate Justice Coalition. And in September, thousands of us marched in every province across the country, asking for the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy to take action to move away from these polluting fossil fuels. And, you know, Gareth will tell you that the department is responsive to civil society. I see here even in the chat, he's asked Cleo to get in touch. But we have been in touch. They said they would get back to us after a week. It's a month and a bit later. The only response we got is Mr. Montache actually threatening to sue us for defamation, for writing about the harms that the department is imposing on communities and the corrupt projects that they're running. These myths about clean coal as well also need to be debunked. You know, countries have wasted billions and billions trying to invest in these so-called clean coal technologies. When they told us they were going to build Madupi, they promised that they wouldn't store clean coal. Now they say it's too expensive, they can't do it. There's no such thing as clean coal, and the DMRE needs to stop telling us that dirty lie. When we return, we discuss South Africa's energy future. Stay with us. Welcome back to The Big Debate. At COP26, President Cyril Ramaphosa announced that South Africa is set to receive 131 billion rands to help end our reliance on coal. This could be a leap towards South Africa's renewable energy future, but will it cover the massive costs needed to start the transition? And what should the money be used for? As we move away from jobs in coal, presumably we need jobs in solar energy, jobs in wind energy, manufacturing solar panels, would be a lot more jobs, but currently we don't make panels in large quantities in South Africa. So let's let's hear the vision here. Lungile, I'll start with you. What's the vision? There is no vision. There's a disconnect between what government has been saying, which is the DMRE, that we are going to still pursue coal and we're still going to pursue gas. And then there's this deal that is signed. Personally, looking at this deal, we need to trade with extreme caution, number one. So this money is being granted in two ways. One, you've got concessional funding, which is low interest rate loans. On the other side, you've got grants as well, which makes up a small amount. What we've typically seen in other countries as this plays out is that the grant is then used for studies, feasibilities, and consultants. And that money ultimately goes back to those donor countries because they will insist on their consultants coming and carrying out all that work. Then you've got on the other side, the concessional funding. That they are yet to develop a framework. But what we've been told is that it's money to repurpose ESCOM's current fleet is for renewables. We're also being told it is um, for the coal community and, you know, workers. But they haven't really said what they're actually going to do. So, Matthew, it sounds as if you as Labour need to be very vigilant because, as Lungile says, Quite frankly, we, we don't know what's in this deal, what it says about communities and about labor. Look, I think the first thing is we must welcome the deal. As COSATA, we, we support it, but the, the devil will be in the detail. We need to work as COSATA with government, with ESCOM, with business partners to make sure that it does provide for a just transition in the full sense. There are huge opportunities in renewable energy and for manufacturing of solar panels to wind turbines. But also there's a need for ESCOM to itself become heavily invested in renewable energy as an owner, not merely as a procurer. So there are massive opportunities, but we need to work hard to make sure no worker and no community is left behind. Michelle, as activists, as young people, were you excited when you heard that the United States, the UK and others are going to give us all this money to help our transition? 
Not at all. I would like to differ when it comes to welcoming the deal. I think we really need to look at what it means for South Africa and why now all of a sudden we're just being given this money. One of the problems that we're having is that we're hearing this new commitment to clean coal. It's really, really worrisome if we're going to be talking about a just transition. We are going to be committed to continually make the South African landscape more unequal by investing in clean coal. The, the vision just does not exist yet, and we can't welcome this deal just yet. It would be very, very gullible to do that because we don't know what it means for this country. Patrick, I mean, your thoughts on uh, on the deal. and How do we know that these grants or loans or whatever you want to call them will not be used to refinance, to boost the coffers of ESCOM under the guise of a transition to renewables? Or even worse, the, the, what, let me call them the climate imperialist powers, right? And you've just named them, right? the US, the UK, Germany, and France. So they don't have our interests at heart. We don't have to play around with that. They want ESCOM to repay corrupt loans. The World Bank made its biggest ever loan for uh, Hitachi to basically buy the ANC. And what we really need is to declare that as odious debt. And it can be done. There's plenty of cases where if a corrupt regime have taken on loans that are in the interests of you know, maintenance of corruption, not serving us with electricity, they can be defaulted on. It's an in international law. And so what the climate imperialists don't want is for us to have that discussion about where ESCOM could actually get money, which is by not paying back these odious debts. Because the uh, last point is that as our currency declines, we have to pay back not in rands, but in dollars or in euros or in pounds. And that becomes very expensive. So when you hear concessional, please let's keep asking tough questions and ask, is this putting our kids in uh, debt for future generations? Michelle's critiques are exactly right, because if it's gas, if it's the so-called clean coal, or if it's elite kind of uh, environmentalism like electric vehicles for rich people, then this isn't a just transition. Do you trust ESCOM and Sasol to do just transitions, uh, Matthew, when they've been fighting workers, fighting communities, and um, messing the environment their entire uh, uh, corporate histories. I wouldn't. Lungile, should any investment into transitions to renewable energy in any part of Africa be framed in a, in a loan or a grant, given that the rich nations are the biggest polluters? Shouldn't they be paying us? Shouldn't they be giving us the money? Absolutely. So South Africa contributes 1.3% to global emissions. However, we are being treated as though we contribute 97%. Ideally, how we would have liked to have seen this is through grants for us to reduce our emissions. Now we've been giving loans. And what's very critical is that we're being called a test case. So the likes of the U.S., China, India, Australia, they've said we're not reducing our coal um uh, use. In fact, we're going to keep it as it is and we'll find alternative means. So it's almost like it's shoved down the global south because we're desperate for this money. Let's hear from our audience. Ulrich Stienkamp. You need to take care of what, what, what's going on in the details of these kinds of things. But the issue is majority of these things are, are getting pushed whilst the core issues are being ignored. Um, yes, the, the, the global north has built their basic uh, number one status on the backs of the global south, and it is time for them to repay. It is also time for them to actually use us to develop in a better way than what the, how they develop, because we can actually now try and get that development in a way that is actually fair and just and environmentally friendly. But instead of that, we are basically copycats, and we are now copying what the global north has done in order to get them to be a developed nation. There are alternatives to provide baseload energy, but we are ignoring them because we are so addicted to our fossil fuels and we are so scared of just saying to the big companies that have these special pricing agreements, listen, you're paying less for electricity, electricity prices are going to go up for you guys more than it's going to go up for the communities because the communities, the people on the grounds are the ones that use the least amount of our electricity, but we're paying back to ESCOM the majority of it. And that is completely unfair, I believe. The department and all of those involved in the energy sector are short-sighted. You can't build the world for infinite development when there's finite resources. We must try and actually utilize the resources that we have in abundance instead of the ones that the, the, the powers that be have built themselves up to be number one. Thanks, Ulrich. When we return, we hear more from our audience.
Welcome back to the big debate. Do you think South Africa is committed to a transition from coal to renewable energy? And will we be able to do it in a way that will create new jobs and protect the livelihoods of the poor and working class? I want to hear from our audience. Uh, Thomas? ESCO from, from the onset, they never had part of their mandate to provide energy to people. They always create cheap energy to provide base load. So that's why you find people living less than a kilometer away from the power station without energy. Never mind the cost to health, the cost to water, and the cost to land to people. So I think we need to think about that. Now, in terms of um, the current funding, I think it's a right step, but we need to make sure that it's very transparent. We need to know how much of that money is new funds, because we, we know ESCOM has debt, we know the government has debt because of the energy system. How much of it is a grant? And what are the concessionalities? If, if there's concessionality funding, what are the conditions? How do we ensure that that becomes public? Based on the research that we've done at the Alternative Information and Development Center, it's clear that if we want to shift South Africa to a low carbon economy, that we have to transform ESCOM into a fully uh, public renewable facility. If ESCOM collapses, it doesn't only put the economy at risk, it also put the whole idea of a just transition at risk. The critical question then is where will the money come from? And in addition to what Professor Bond says about the cancellation of ODS debt, at AIDC we are arguing that we should utilize the accumulated reserves of the government employees pension fund and redirect it to ESCOM on condition that it transforms itself to a fully public renewable energy utility so that we can start on a low carbon reindustrialization program that puts climate and the jobs at the center of the economy. As people who are mostly affected by these uh, coal power stations, we support this move into a renewable energy. We appreciate the funds from these um, countries and we hope everything will be transparent to everyone. Just on the question of clean coal, Professor Bond has already pointed out that we didn't get it right at Madupi. It's built into the contract. Uh, the contract is probably going to be reneged on with it come, when it comes to the closed carbon sequestration. So how are we going to get it right in the future? I have no belief in us being able to put clean coal um, into practice in South Africa which makes it even more worrying that one of the biggest development projects that South Africa has projected uh, to pull us out of the COVID uh, slump is the Messina Mercado Special Economic Zone funded by China in the middle of the Limpopo province, which is also to have a coal-fired uh, plant at its center, which, according to the CEO, Lechelona Masoga, is also going to rely on ultra-super critical clean coal. So we just been sold a story about clean coal, which hasn't been gotten right, and where it has been gotten right has been, it's been a huge expense, and it's still not clean, as we know. So I think we really need to work on rubbishing that idea. And then lastly, just on the concessional grants, loans, we don't know what exactly for exactly what from the global north to South Africa. Never mind all the terms and conditions. I mean, those are problematic in their own right, but we're getting money from the biggest polluters they should be giving us the money. Why are they lending us more money when we're already completely overborrowed? Why are we allowing mines to come in and extract and at the same time destroying the land, destroying the vegetation, poisoning the water, poisoning communities, causing children under five to be poisoned by um, the air quality of coal? And at the same time, that same plant and vegetation is so important in sequestering the carbon emissions that we do emit. So why are we not looking at forest farming? Why are we not looking at permaculture? Why are we not allowing communities to grow their own food in sustainable ways that will also help us to combat carbon emissions? Instead of this false argument that mines are creating jobs, no, mines are creating dead sentences for those miners as well as for the communities. And why? For those who are profiting at the top. Thank you so very much. When we return, we hear final words from our panel. Welcome back to the big debate on climate and energy. 
we're hearing the last comments from our panel. Let me start with Gareth Besaidenhout. Thank you again for the for the opportunity. It's quite enlightening and some very valuable inputs. In order for us to move towards a just transition as envisaged in the NDP to a climate resilient and low carbon economy, we need to start at the sectoral level. And I think we are doing work in that regard. From the DMRE side, we are engaged in developing a just energy transition framework that is supposed to then inform the IRP and energy policy development going forward. In addition to that, there's a number of government initiatives that are going on. I think critical and key to this debate and discussion is also the fact that we need to bring convergence within uh, government, but also society broadly. And, and in the context of a social compact, be able to drive this just energy transition in a manner that leaves no one behind and that we focus on the most vulnerable, which in this case, is the actual workers in industry, in coal, as well as the communities affected by what will ultimately be a very disruptive process to our economy. And Thank you, Gareth. We, we're running out of time. We have to leave it there. Uh, Lungile? We have to strike a balance between socioeconomic needs and our need for electricity and to grow the economy as well. There is no doubt about it. We do need to transition. However, it needs to be at a scale and a pace that South Africa can afford, both from a human capital point of view and from a financial point of view. Thank you. Matthew? We're dealing with many crises. We have a 44% unemployment rate. We have coal, mine, and energy workers' jobs at risk. We have towns whose economies are in danger. We have climate change problems. We have a shortage of energy right now, which is going to get worse. So we have to deal with all these issues at once. The finance deal from COP26 is a huge game changer. We must welcome it. It can assist us to deal with all these issues. If I think our last point as Kosato is that we must make sure that no workers left behind, no communities left behind. And in fact, we must actually see how can we multiply the job and economic opportunities? How can we exceed our climate change targets? And renewable energy will be at the center of that. Michelle? The money that we've just got is not going to help us deal with all of the problems that we have. When we start talking about the just energy transition, we must recognize that it falls within the just transition. So we cannot separate the two. And when we start looking at it from there, then we start actually engaging communities and wanting to know how we can move forward together. They is so much that needs fixing apart from our energy crisis and it is a crisis and when we start um, treating it like that we may be in a position to actually move forward justly a just transition would include the redistribution of land it would include the redistribution of wealth so we cannot afford to separate the two because they are linked thank you very much michelle patrick i'm so impressed that the um, generational anger from Michelle cuts very clearly into what we must do as policy. And what you've done as ever already is clarified divisions and clarified what's at stake, including this nonsense of clean coal, where it hasn't worked anywhere in the world. We're still getting the gas to methane, even though methane is much worse than CO2. We're still accepting the bona fides of the imperialists who should be paying a climate debt as should South Africans, especially those of us who are in the elites. There's two words that I learned trying to help in the fight against racial apartheid. And those two now go very well in the fight against climate apartheid and energy apartheid. Manda, away to power to the people. Thank you, Patrick and Matthew. Michelle and Lungile as well. Humanity faces an unprecedented climate crisis as the world heats up. The future for our children and their children looks increasingly uncertain. With each day that South Africa continues to burn coal, we face the likelihood of extreme weather events, failed crops and famine. A move away from coal requires new jobs and confronting vested interests. Do our leaders have the vision and commitment to find solutions that will safeguard everyone's future? You decide. I'm Ridi Khabi, and you've been watching The Big Debate.